Hi guys, this is Fernando doing another video for the Mars Survivalist. In this case, I'm going to be talking about why do knives sometimes fail. This is a video, uh, it's going to be a video about you having more information for when the time comes to make a purchase, buying a knife here and there. Basically, it comes down to two points. First one is um, a problem in the steel and heat treatment, mostly about the heat treatment. Sometimes people get fixated with it with steels uh, the best steel on the planet is going to be performing very poorly with a poor heat treatment even uh, a mediocre steel properly heat treated will do well gonna be talking about a, a bit that later it's also about a design flaw it's uh, the second most common problem in terms of of nice failing uh, a design decision was was made uh, poorly and it either compromises the integrity of the blade or or the handle which is the what the handle is basically the interface between you and the blade and a, a problem in that design compromises the utility of such tool there's about the first point steel and heat treatment there's arguably any better example than the case of the not that long reviewed by myself Hunglas, the SE Hunglas. The SE Hunglas is actually the exact same knife as another knife that's called the Artac 2. The Ontario Artac 2 is, exact, is the exact same knife, it's the exact same steel. Both of these are 1095. You know, I don't have an Artac 2 because I don't buy stuff that I know already is going to be failing and stuff that has performed poorly in the past but <laughs> take it uh, take my word for it it looks the exact same uh, as the SE Hunglas now being the, the same shape being the same steel the only difference was the heat treatment and with the poorly or unfortunate um, heat treatment in the Artac 2 that made all the difference in the world there's lots of videos in YouTube showing how the Artac 2 fails catastrophically it chips in large chunks when caught when uh, under normal use conditions chopping wood cutting a limb here and there uh, or even the most minimum amount of, of abuse causes the the blade to break uh, sometimes in half so it's clearly a, a matter of, of a poor heat treatment what happens the blade becomes too hard too brittle and it just cannot take the stress cannot take the punishment that the same blade properly heat treated would have done. You usually can tell when that happens because it, it shatters, it breaks like glass. Uh, it happened to me with, during a, a class when we were um, we were forging blades and one of the blades broke because of that. It becomes too, too hard, too brittle during the heat treatment process and it just snaps like, like glass. Um, when that happens to you in some of in some moment when you're needing that blade the most, yeah, it's uh, it's not pleasant, but it is a possibility. There again, there's videos of that on YouTube, seeing people uh, how the uh, the Artac two breaks on them. All right, the second uh, possible cause of, of of a knife failure is gonna be because of a, of a design flaw, because of a poorly made decision in in the moment of design. One of, one of the best uh, examples of that would be a, a knife that I've seen is called the Buck Hudlum. The, the Buck Hudlum is basically, it's a rather long blade, I think it's around 10 inches. Yeah, it's going to be doing a little bigger one. Uh, Buck Hudlums, hoping I'm pronouncing that well. It's a rather thin, long blade. And it's all everything okay with it. Well, it has it has a bit of a handle that has too much of a finger growth, which I wouldn't find pleasant um, at all. Uh, so that would could be a possible inconvenience. But worst of all, it has a notch here, right? Doing that a bit bigger, in case you're not quite seeing it. Basically, here on the spine, it has a notch. All right. Now, given that this is this is probably a full flat grind or or high saber grind blade, it's basically going to be something like this. Let's move this up, up a bit. It's going to be something like this. I think it's a full flat ground blade. All right. The cross section would be looking something like that, made of steel, of course. Now, on this section, when we move up to this notch, 
we find that it loses a considerable amount of steel precisely in the spine exactly in the place where it needs it the most and where the knife is usually the strongest this uh, this notch is, take, is taking away material for one and, and besides that it's creating a tension, uh, a stress point it's creating a stress point where any punishment you put into this blade it's gonna be uh, it multiplying itself in this region all right it what that was like a, a huge red uh, red flag for me when I saw that I saw mm, that things that's not gonna be doing well at all and you know I went online looked at uh, looked it up in on YouTube and I found easily two or three examples of people that had used this this is a 10 inch blade I think it was it's, yeah it's 10 inch blade this is a blade that you would be using for batoning and cutting through wood because of the size of the blade it gives it for for that purpose now the thing what happens is that when you have structurally speaking let's suppose you have this this element would be something like this and like that and force here right if this doesn't make any sense to you imagine this is the knife right this is the log you're batoning through this is the baton you're hitting with and this is your hand holding Structu structurally speaking this would be the setup you have force here and you have a isostatic system what's called in structures it w this would be an isostatic system now when you apply force here what happens in this section if we look at this section we will have something like this and on this upper part of of the blade is going to be going in, into into traction all right this particles on the upper section are trying are, are going to be trying to separate themselves and on the lower section it's there's going to be compression all right it's particles getting pushed together to one another right so you have on, on the blade you have both traction and compression now in the place in, in the in, in this in the space where you have this traction because of this notch you have basically nothing at all and awful awful design decision that is going to be causing the blade to to fail rather quickly i think that they tried to solve this uh, design inconvenience by reducing uh, the deafness of this notch a bit um, I still wouldn't go for that blade. I still wouldn't go for that blade because it's just a bad, it's simply a bad call to remove material in this area, right? And again, just looking at the knife, knowing that they had messed up with, um, with that notch there, I knew that would be the, the exact stress point where it would, it would be breaking and as I went on online, went uh, to YouTube, I saw a couple people that had that same problem. Batoning through a piece of wood, simply batoning through a piece of wood, the, um, the blade snapped in this, in this place, right here, where the notch is, it snapped. Now, uh, I also saw that Buck had some videos of, of uh, explaining how this notch didn't affect the integrity of the blade and because it could take... Uh, thousands of tons of abuse and they had actually a machine hitting it here in this area uh, so as to prove that the notch didn't affect it uh, in any way now you know the, the thing is with some of these tests by, by knife makers is that they are performed in still ideal conditions you have a knife that is being kept in a vise alright and you have a perfectly um, oriented a uh, strike force right it's not the same as someone somehow placing the blade and hitting it in, in not an exactly 90 degree angle uh, that's always um, more more abusive to the knife that some perfectly done test where everything is angled to its maximum uh, performance right you have 90 degree angle and a machine slamming it and you have a vice keeping it that way uh, it may seem a very abusive test but it's still a very controlled um, uh, situation for that knife right that would be a, an example of something that um, that you'd like to avoid anything anything that is notches or, or groves or any 
any significant depressions or uh, lack of material in the spine of the blade, full flat ground blades already are sacrificing some of the toughness provided by a saber grind. A saber grind is going to be giving you more material in the spine and it's going to be tougher. A full flat ground blade usually it's not a big deal if you have a, a good size of a knife. If you have for example the junglas which is almost a full flat ground it's not completely full flat, full flat it's almost it's a saber grind high saber grind because it's flat in this area but even if it were a full flat blade it wouldn't be that big a deal because you have uh, an important amount of, of material all across the blade. Now if you start notching or putting notches here it's gonna be, it could be more problematic. This same thing, um, there there's a knife, uh, a blacksmith called Wayne Goodard, he explained in one of his books the wonders of knife making <laughs> yeah the kind of the kind of stuff I read so that would be more informed for you guys he was explaining that um, one of the common problems in sword making was that uh, when they did the narrow tank they would do a 90 degree angle and this creates as I mentioned before it creates a, a point of stress and that's why these blades, these, uh, these swords would break precisely here in the narrow tank. They soon figured out that rounding that a little bit would make a much tougher blade and it, it gets rid of that potential stress point. All right? Rounding it up instead of having a, a 90 degree angle gets rid of, of that potential stress point. Um, another uh, example of of a flaw in, in design would be in this knife that I've showed you guys before, the Condor Kumunga, which is very good. It's, this is 1075 steel, properly heat treated, done correctly, but when it came to the handle, uh, they just ended up doing something that's a bit too short for uh, average size hands such as mine, and let alone a, a big paw, someone with a big hand, large size hands he would definitely have problems with this because my hands that aren't huge or anything uh, it's still a bit small problem in design number one problem in design number two is a poor choice in placing this hole here exactly where your hand goes so if you have a lanyard here you're gonna be having your hand on it all the time and as, as you do work it's gonna be creating blisters uh, tearing through skin potential problems that you could simply have avoid by moving this hole over here and increasing the size of the handle just a little bit. That's not anything, uh, I mean, it's, I, I still like this knife and I, I do recommend it for someone looking for a good budget blade because with a sand belt grinder you can work this up a bit, flatten the sizes, the, the sides of the handle and I'm gonna be trying to do another hole over here that's something that will be more convenient. In, in terms, now that, that's basically it for in terms of, of design flaw. In terms of, of steel heat treatment, one, one other thing that I'd like you guys to keep in mind is don't get too fixated with the best possible steel there is. I have a ton of knives. I collect knives. I've been doing that for, for many years. It's, um, it's not anything new to me right but um, I sometimes see that I sometimes see people fixating well this is a 440 steel which is awful and it sucks or it's stainless steel and a survival knife has to be carbon high carbon steel it's not that simple actually even the worst possible steel if properly heat treated it's gonna be performing very well don't get too hang up on that. A, a good example of this, uh, there's this guy, he, he, went, uh, he did videos on YouTube by the name of Nas. For some reason those videos are no longer there, which is a, a real pity because they were great. They were destruction tests of knives. Now people, as soon as you mentioned that, destruction tests and, and flexing to 90 degrees and, and blasting through bricks and whatever, uh, people um, that are into knives, some of them go, well that's not the proper use of a knife, I have no use for that, I have no interest in that. Uh, I'm not that sort of, pe of, of guy, I think that it's actually quite inter interesting to see uh, how much abuse 
can a knife take? Uh, ideally, we all use knives in proper condition and we don't abuse them, but I still like to know what knife can take what amount of abuse. It's something that uh, appeals to me, that kind of knowledge. One of the things that you could learn from watching the, these videos by NOS was that, for example, one of the best performing blades was uh, the blades by Boosie because of their infi steel and their heat treatment, which is quite uh, well done. It's uh, in those NOS tests, it was the, the knife that performed the best, in my opinion, and the opinion of most other people, including NOS himself, who is the guy that did these, these videos. Uh, they would chop through wood very well, they would not, not only do that, but after being abused by chopping through uh, brick or mortar, uh, bricks and, and cement blocks, it would still do okay. It wouldn't chip and it wouldn't break easily. Uh, but you're talking about one of the most expensive knives there is. Boosie knives are expensive, there's no way around that. They are great, I like them a lot, I have a few of them. Uh, I recommend to people that want to buy them if, if they want the best of the best. Yet at the same time, maybe the second best performing uh, knives in those videos were, were the machetes by Cold Steel. All right, so in, in number one position, I'd say that the Boosie knives were, were it. Now, for a close second position, you have the machetes by Cold Steel, that it's, you're talking about uh, like 600 buck knife or 700 buck knife or in the case of the Battle Mistress, which is the specific knife used by, by NOS in those tests, you're talking about 800, 1000 buck knife. And at the same time you would see that a 20 buck machete w was doing almost as well, pretty much almost as well, just, you know, a, a tad under it. Uh, and it's a 20 buck knife against a, a thousand buck knife and you're talking about infi steel which is very specific very expensive and the other one is ordinary 1055 machete steel used all over the world now what is the the secret to this well it's actually about uh, choosing a reasonable material such as 1050 1055 which is okay and the proper heat treatment right and you combine that with a classic design for example such as this this kukri not doing anything outrageous or ridiculous not putting a notch here where it would have failed or, or, a, or a large one over here not doing anything too drastic in terms of blade design that's pretty much it even poor steel examples such as a 440a steel which would be considered a poor uh, cho choice of a, of a steel 440A properly heat treated is still going to be performing well. It's not something that you should throw into the garbage because because of the steel. You don't have to be steel uh, snobs, okay, folks. It's not always that you have you know VG10 or, yes, or or 1095 is the only steel for me. You, know, you have to be a bit more open minded and understand a bit more about these things. These things. The the Kumunga, the Condor Kumunga, which uh, I use this knife for chopping through wood. I abuse this knife a little bit by by cutting uh, on cement surface, going through the going through the, the chunk of wood I was cutting and actually hitting, impacting with considerable force against the cement. It would it would roll and chip a bit, but it still did well. It didn't crack. It didn't break. It didn't chip considerably. Didn't fail catastrophically on me like like the Artac 2 did in several videos by just breaking like a piece of glass. Just a bit of, of, of resharpening with a nail file, that was enough to bring it back to razor sharp. That's, uh, in my opinion, that's good steel and that's good uh, steel heat treatment as well. Folks, bit more information for you guys to have there and keep in mind and remember when you're looking to make your next purchase. Folks, if you like what you're seeing, consider subscribing, the button somewhere over there. There's going to be more videos. There's going to be more videos on, on survival, preparedness, and this type of, of mindset that I like promoting in, in these videos, in my blog as well, in themodernsurvivalist.com. So keep in touch and see you in our next video. Take care.